Sandy Springs, Georgia looks like almost any other town in America, except for one key difference. The entire town is run by a private company. How does this work? And do the people like it? People love it. Oliver Porter was a leader in the creation of the new privately run city of 100,000 people. The model that I created, which is very different, uh, is using private industry to provide the services. Services like administration, 911, the water department, permitting, parks and recreation, and more, all run by a private company. What's the difference when a private company runs a city? Well, let's take the case of a pothole. I'm driving along the road one day and I hit a pothole. Uh, what do I do? If someone calls our city, they get a live person. They don't get all these menus, dial one, dial two, to, they get a live person. That person will either give them a response immediately to their problem, and then let's take the pothole. I hit found a pothole. Okay, that has to go to, to our road maintenance department. They will immediately transfer them there, but at the same time, they will ask you, actually issue a work order into the system that says fix pothole at 150 Haversham Waters, whatever. So I call and I complain about a pothole, I get, how, how long does it take for me to, to be on hold? Um, it's almost instantaneous normally. They have, we have, you can require in the contract what level you want. You can say it's got to be answered within two rings. It's got to be answered within five rings. But in our case, it's answered very quickly. And here's something else. That you have to get a response as to what is being done about that within two days. And if it's a, what we would call an emergency, not a 911 emergency, but emergency such as, well, the lot across the street for me, somebody's out there cutting down the trees. They shouldn't be. Two hours, you have to get a response for that. And that response doesn't necessarily say it's fixed, of course, but it tells you who's got it and what's being done about it and when it will be fixed. Can I call at midnight? Midnight, 24-7. You get a live person. On Sunday? Oh, Sunday, yep. <laughs> That's the seventh day, or first day. <laughs> been, been on your count of 24-7 year round. Wow. So um, with, with so much uh, responsiveness, I would think that the cost for the calling, uh, for the call center would, would go up. Um, except that a lot of the bureauc bureaucratic processes, paperwork flowing here and there and all, waste time and all, it far... It pays for that. It saves money. It saves money. It saves money in the long run. Mm. But yes, it's you, you, you know, it's it's an expense part of the city, but it saves money in the long run, and it really moves you up so many notches on the responsiveness scale. Mm. I want to talk about um, other functions of the city. Um, Nine one one emergency. It, yes. The city uh, takes care of that, or the county had been the provider of that. Uh, within about a year, we took that over, contracted it to a private company. Wait a second. A private company running 911? That sounds Absolutely scary. recommend that. Not only uh, is it efficient from our standpoint, far less costly than the county, far better uh, than the county, um, but we've actually been able to share it with other cities, which cut our cost by about two-thirds. What about people who say, well, if nine, if 911 were run by a company, then you would have a greedy company trying to make a profit by not um, responding or by, by saying, well, they're not really in danger. Why should we go save them? Sure. Um, what, do you, what do you say to critics about this model? It's free market. Um, if they don't perform, they don't keep the contract. They're out. Unlike the county, which you couldn't get rid of, and I guess my, the horror story that I keep remembering about the county 911 was we had a death caused by a 911 operator's incompetence and inefficiency. That was three or four years ago. She's still on the payroll. Still haven't been able to get rid of her in the courts, even though she had a 12-year record of coming to work drunk, going to sleep at the board, falling off her seat, and then a death. That's the problem with bureaucracies. You, you can neither hire, fire, or, or discipline or reward. The motivation aspect of our employees is something that's 
hard to measure but easy to see. The ability to give people raises and to the, to to fire them is uh, is critical to the carrot and the stick. It's the free market. Mm-hmm. Yeah, previous employees of other governments have come to me and said, "I tried for years to to tell people that I wasn't doing this, we weren't doing this job right, that there was a better way, and nobody cared." And basically, people give up. There's no reward for butting your head against a system that won't listen. They come into this system, and not only are they heard, people, the companies are begging them for ideas, because guess what? There's a profit motive in there. If they can do it more efficiently, find a better way to do it, they can make more money. And great, let them do that. Okay, so courts, police, fire, all run by the, uh, by the city. Mm-hmm. Um, but what about jails? Was that run by the corporation or the city or how, how does that work well it's part of the public safety so it was run by the city but we didn't build any jails we went out and rented jail space uh, others municipal governments had uh, spare capacity of the counties uh it's a good deal for both sides they got money for their unused capacity and we got a very good deal in terms of uh, our cost we didn't have to go into a capital program to build jails so you're renting space in other people's jails yeah. just like someone might rent an apartment or something exactly. you rent you rent yeah. the jail and you yeah. can you can utilize and by it. the way it's competitive we uh we might be with one jail system for a while and then go to another one because they said hmm, we got some space and we'd rather, we'll give you a better rate the jails want you to rent from them yeah because they're sitting there with spare capacity okay so what about city hall well we don't own the city hall or any administrative buildings um, in the original contract, the companies were to provide space for that, and they did. And uh, they got very good deals as a large company renting space that we couldn't get as a city. Um, and they have provided us with excellent uh, city hall and administrative buildings now for nine years at a very low cost. So you do have a city hall? We have a city hall, but we don't own it. Oh. The company that... provides the space, uh, uh, built it out, and equipped. So a city hall is just something as simple as an as office space. In effect, it is, yeah. It's office space. You don't that... need some glorified Taj Mahal of a public building for that. Get yourself something that is a, a good administrative space that a, that a good company would use for administrative space, and uh, it's very efficient. I'm here at the city hall of Sandy Springs, which is actually just a regular office building. Renting office space keeps the cost down, and you won't find any extravagant monuments here. But what you will find are private companies that manage everything from the parks to the sewage to the traffic to the permits. Let's take a look at some of the parks. I'm here at Abernathy Park, which is a private park in the city of Sandy Springs. Most of the equipment here looks like a work of art, and most of it was donated. You have nice parks here? Very nice now. Uh, we did not before. And more parks? More parks, better parks. So um, outsourcing has led to more and better parks. Yeah, in, in the because the savings that you get from the efficiency in running operations can then be used for things like parks. Uh, it could be used to build up the police force. You mentioned savings. Yeah. Um, does Sandy Springs have a surplus? Sandy Springs does have a surplus. I started in the beginning saying the two measures were efficiency and responsiveness. Well, on the efficiency side, I told you we'd not raise taxes while increasing services. And right through the recession, when others were having problems, built a $45 million reserve. And, and we have zero long-term debt and unfunded liabilities for pensions or health benefits the things that are taking cities, counties into bankruptcy, we have none of that, and we don't intend to have any of that. What do you do with that surplus then? Well, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to totally redevelop the whole downtown area. That is going to take, you know, that will probably take us into some debt, except once again, I I sincerely hope and trust because of, of the people we've elected that they will do this in a public-private partnership, just like we have done the services, and bring in a a good deal of private development money 
into the process that will keep the city from going deeply in debt to, to rebuild its entire downtown. Yeah, but let's say that let's say that you have a city that create that has a huge surplus, which cities are not used to having, right. by the way, right? right? So that's amazing, first of all. Right. But um, shouldn't that money then go back to the taxpayer? You have choices. You have a lot of choices. I would say, I think I've outlined like six or seven in my book, but and I don't, I didn't try to tell our elected officials how to make those choices, but here are the choices. Um, number one, you, you have you can lower taxes. Okay, they haven't done that because they're looking forward to this huge redevelopment project. For one, two, you can provide more services with that money, and we have done exactly that. Okay, three, uh, you can. Avoid debt by using the reserve instead of debt. Or if you had debt as an existing city, you could pay down on that debt. Four, you can, um, if you have unfunded liabilities for pensions and other things, you could pay that down, fund those with it. Um, gosh, there are a couple more, but they're all choices that things that, that should be made, be. not by, and it's, certainly the company has nothing to do with those choices. Again, it's your elected officials have this surplus and they can you can go build parks for instance without having to go into debt for them did you ever um ask the citizens if they want the money back or um uh, like actually that? at one point when we were looking particularly the good i went before the council uh with a plea that we actually reduce taxes uh and it was their decision uh, not to do that, but to, to increase the res let it increase the reserve and to put it into services. So that money went back into infrastructure. Yeah. Then. Mm -hmm. And that helped build more parks and All um, of that. Re redevelopment. Yeah. And that's, that's, the, that's the choice that they're there for. That's what they should be making, not getting involved in the day-to-day -day details of running a city mm -hmm. because they're not experts. They're part-time elected officials. But they should be expressing the will of the people. Do the people, would the people like a tax rebate? Or would they rather have more service? That's the kind of choices they, they do and should be making. Sandy Springs, when I checked, has um, four or five Fortune 500 companies in this area, um, which is more than um, Atlanta in well, general. Exactly. Actually, we do. And, um, and more are on the way. Yes. Uh, why, why is that? Why are companies um, running to, to come here? Well, one, it's, it's a good place to live. Uh, it is a strong community with uh, nice residences in most cases. People want to come. It's a beautiful place. It is a beautiful place. Hawaii is a beautiful place, too. Oh, yes. And there's a, uh, lots of people would love to live there and, and work there and, and move there. And I'd love for them to invite me to come out right. and Right, I'd love to this. invite you, of course, yeah. <laughs> It's a beautiful place, but but businesses are running away, yeah, and and they're coming here instead. And um, and if you tell me that without knowing any more about it, I'm going to say you have too much regulation. Mm -hmm. Businesses despise too much regulation. They recognize the need for reasonable regulation, but when you put a layer upon a layer of hindrances upon them, mm -hmm. you're not going to attract business. Um, well. How do other cities um, follow this model? Let's say a city elsewhere wanted to incorporate. Um, right. How do you do that? How do you make a city? Well, in the years that followed, I said Sandy Springs was 50 years in the making. <laughs> um, the next year, two more came into being. In total, there were six cities that incorporated after Sandy Springs, following the same model. And six more are on the way. It all started when Oliver came up with a plan for how to create a new city. So I went home from the meeting and on a pad of paper drew up a plan for how to start a city. You critical drew, path, a, drew you a plan know, for how to start a critical city? Critical paths, you know, uh, all those sort of things. Um, sort of a little perch chart, if you were familiar with that, and brought it in, the committee passed it, and then we didn't get to bill that year. And the next year I put a new date on the same plan, brought it in, they passed it, we didn't get to bill, and that, but then all of a sudden there was a change of the political power in the state and we were told, your bill is going to be number one. And we said, uh-oh, we're kind of like the dog that caught a train. You know, I got it. What I do with it? Um, be careful what you wish for. Yes. <laughs> everybody kind of looked around and said, where's yeah. that plan you, you, that nobody paid any attention to? And I said, well, I've still got it. And can you implement it? And I said, well, um, 
I will under two conditions. Uh, one, um, we have no time. We only have months now to start a city of almost 100,000 people. So we can't run it by committee. If you're going to ask me to do it, I've got to have some authority. How many months did decisions. you have? How many months? At that point, we're in the middle of January. We had to have the city December 1st. But the bill didn't even pass, finally, until April. And the referendum that it called for didn't occur until June so we didn't know for sure we were going to have a city until June, and we got to have it first of December, four months, five months later. So you have four or five months yeah, to, to really create really do a it. new city. But I said, you know, if you want me to do it, give me some authority to move on my own and give me a title because I've been trying to talk to other cities, and as this is a committee person, nobody give me the time of day. But I think if you give me the title of interim city manager, it'll help me. And it really did. It's funny. I started calling mayors and saying, this is the interim city manager for Sandy Springs. And they'd answer my calls. So it's, it's semantics, but it was important. Okay, can, so, I, can I hold on for a sec? So yeah. you um, were just a person. Just a person. It, it's not with like no, you, With no government background. You, with no back, background. Right. You didn't actually have any real power. None. In, in any real government None. yet. And... Um, and, and on December first, you had to have a, a city fully put together. City. Um, so I sat down right here in this house and wrote a letter to twenty-four companies, national, international companies that looked like they might be able to do what we needed. And in that, I asked two questions. I, I gave them a matrix of the 12 major areas of service and said, where have you done this for a city or a county or maybe even a state or military? Tell me where you have done this. And the second question is, would you spend the millions of dollars and the resources to start this city for us without a contract? Because I can't give you one. Not until the day the city starts. So Can you're we... going up to companies and asking them, yep. will you help us create a city right. and we won't we have can't a, give you a contract. We can't give you a contract. It turned out they spent about $5 million in advance without a contract. Let me try to summarize. How to make a city, how to incorporate a city. Um, go to, well, first you have to state, look at your state legal process. Exactly. And in this case, you had to pass a referendum um, that would allow you to begin um, forming a new city. Exactly. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Correct. And then after that, you had a uh, a governor's uh, commission, in your case, right? Appointed, yes. Appointed that you had to work with in right. um, creating a request for proposal f um, to companies that could help you um, run the right. city. Is issuing those proposals, it was helpful to be able to go as the interim city manager to myself as chairman of the governor's commission to get things passed. That helped a little bit, <laughs> smoothing right. things out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. And uh, then and then you have to then you can start bidding to companies right. to say, will you help us, will you help us, and, and how much will it cost, right. et cetera. Exactly. So the, the niggly details of that. And then um, in your case, on December 1st, um, what happened? Well, the new council was sworn in. Uh, and the reason we did it at mid one minute after midnight was we wanted no gap in the laws from the time the county's statutes ended to when ours began. Uh, there was a fear of some people slipping some things in there in that no man's land. So we did that, and they passed their ordinances, statutes, and ordinances were already prepared for them. We had them on laptops in front of them, uh, exactly, you know. And Everything's ready. Everything. The company has done all this. Yeah. Trained them. They actually had training sessions for them on how to use their laptops mm -hmm. and all of these. It's, it's all up on a screen so the public, and there was a big public attendance, could see it all. Was there a big public attendance? Absolutely, for those first council meetings that were standing room only. At midnight? Yeah. Absolutely. This was a monumental thing. We'd been fighting for 30 years for this. What, what happened when the, <clears throat> the clock struck midnight? that clock struck one what what happened well people said it's the first time they had seen me smile in a year that's what happened because i was like a ton just went off my back <laughs> but uh what happened was the the uh we the uh, mayor called a meeting to order uh we had chosen to have an invocation which was a 
sometimes controversial thing. That was the next thing that happened. Um, and then we went right into a very businesslike agenda. And we were knocking down statutes and ordinances and all of that, bam, bam, bam. The contract for the company, by the way, didn't get passed for three weeks. And they would continue to operate without a contract for three weeks to just by virtue of the load. We, we had to get those ordinances and all that in first. There's a lot uh, of trust involved in all this. A lot of trust. You know, that's a key word in all of this. It's a partnership. I call it a public-private partnership. And the key word in all of that may be partnership. Because a company brought tremendous things to the table, and the city had to do a lot of trusting too. The company had to trust they were going to get a contract. We had to trust they were going to live up to their promises. So the company needed you, and you needed the yep. company. Yep. So more than trust, it's there's some uh, self-interest in there too. Mm, symbiotic relationship. Yeah, symbiotic. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. And um, and after that, you had a new town. We had a town immediately. Yeah. Wow. Did you see immediate changes? We saw, yeah, we did, a lot of things. Um, one of the things we haven't talked about was the fact that we don't provide, didn't provide police and fire. Uh, we had had totally under-policed. We had about, best we could tell, about 12 people assigned to our city. Uh, we immediately began to work to increase the size of that and, uh, 12, and get our own force. 12 policemen for a city of 100 Plus. At that time, between 90 and 100, yeah. Okay. And how many did you need? We originally created a force of about 85. And we were able to finance that out of the savings from the other, from the private partnership. Did people lose their jobs in this in the changeover from uh, into, to incorporation? No, no, because there was, there was nothing to lose. Um, there was no city employment. Now, the county... We took away a lot of services from them, and they should have cut their force. A year later, they still hadn't cut their force. Another example of the bureaucratic they miasma you get into. Less work to do. Less work, same force. Same force. Yeah. So um, that's that's an example of the problems we have with bureaucratic government. Hmm. It's, it's almost impossible to get rid of people. So... Um, but but going back, starting a, incorporating a city is isn't impossible though. It can be done. It can be done, uh, and it varies from as I said from state to state. But it certainly can be done. But it's it's hard work and a lot of work. And if people want to um, know more about how to do this, and maybe in their state or just studying your work, where can they find that? Well. <laughs> I would strongly recommend reading my book, <laughs> which which was written uh, not as a novel but as a how to do it. And can I book? Uh, sure, that's the softback then... version. It's a hardback version. The book is called um, "Creating the New City of Sandy Springs," and, and it has a by... subtitle, which is I think pretty good: the twenty first century paradigm private industry. Um, so I'm a strong advocate of the public private partnership mm -hmm. model. And inside the book, um, the first half is how you did it, the steps yes. that you took. The second half is what? It's um, the charter, a sample charter, uh, the RFPs that we used, the request for proposals that we sent out to the companies, and then the contract that resulted from that. And also there is the, the original legislation. Now that's the one that's probably least applicable to other mm -hmm. states. The others, I would say, is pretty generally uh, applicable right. to others. Right, but you've got the, the bill, you've got the request for proposals. You've got the bill, the, the charter, the RFPs, right. the, the contract itself. So this is this is the city right here, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in a sense. That's fairly interesting. And I'm not very political often because I tell elected officials that, uh, you know, you owe it to your citizens. You owe it to them to at least consider an alternative that is now as proven as this is. Uh, not, not just proven in Sandy Springs, but proven, proven in, in other cities. In other cities that have followed right, this model. Right. And uh, it's, um, it's almost criminal to me that, that elected officials are not looking into it. Look, look at all the problems we have with pensions and the unfunded liabilities for them. I mean, Detroit is the, the headline of them all, but 
there's so many governments out there. Again, I call rolling bankruptcies. They're just pushing it off in the future. They're going to happen. And uh, so it's astounding that they're not looking for radically different ideas uh, as to how this might be done in a more efficient and responsive manner. Great. Well, um, thanks for inspiring us, and, and hopefully we can get more uh, cities and counties to, to look into this. And thanks for joining us today, uh, Oliver mm -hmm. Porter. Thank you.